we're proceeding along um, talking about introductory concepts associated with control. And so last time we talked about um, closed loop transfer functions. And so we were talking about things like um, that we might be interested in finding, if we, we did actually find these things, transfer function for how the output responded to a change in the set point and how it changed, how it responded to a change in the um, particular disturbance. And so these, these transfer functions are, are in some sense like open loop transfer functions. Once you have them, you can do things with them. And one of the most logical things you'd want to do is specify a particular change, let's say in the set point of disturbance, actually calculate what the response would be. That, re that is called the closed loop response. Okay, so closed loop response. And so I'm going to proceed to introduce this and give a little motivating example. Then we're just going to go through four different examples of how to do this. This tends to be a bit more painful than calculating the open loop response. Right, so this is, um, these things are closed loop transfer functions, and then you hopefully, because you just had a test on it, remember the, what we call the open loop transfer function, which is the transfer function between the input and the output, okay? And so the first test was basically finding this type of transfer function and then being able to compute the response from it, right? Specify U, calculate the corresponding Y. That is relatively simple compared about it what I'm just going to show you is because the the thing that sits on the right hand side here is usually a lot simpler than the things that sits on the right hand side of these two things okay so it's a little I mean the, conceptually it's the same procedure it's just more likely to be complicated to take the inverse Laplace transform so we'll go through these examples as we go from at three to five they get increasingly complex and you'll get the idea and then at the end I'll do a little simulink example okay so hopefully you're starting to get comfortable with this idea of block diagrams, right? We like to represent things in blocks. So we know like for an open loop system, we like to write this kind of thing. And this is also nice because this is exactly how Simulink represents systems. So um, we're starting to use these blocks a lot. And as we do control, um, we use them quite a bit. So last time I showed you that for a block diagram of a closed loop system, meaning a system connected in feedback. I wonder, just to uh, refresh people's memory here. Sorry, I'll get back to this slide. Just to figure with the test taking place, um, you might have lost your perspective. Okay. So right, this was our generic closed loop block diagram that we've considered so far. It includes uh, the process that relates the Im manipulate input to the output, potentially a disturbance transfer function. This, this tells us how the disturbance affects the output. This is a transfer function for the measurement device. This is the controller. At this point, PI or PID is the only thing you know. We have this little block here just to gain so we can transform the set point into the correct units to generate the error signal. It has to be in the same units as the measurement. Controller sends a signal out to the final control element, usually a control valve, and then the control valve adjusts whatever U is, usually a flow. Um, and so this is a block diagram. And from this block diagram, uh, I guess it was last Thursday, we derived transfer functions for how Y responds to its set point and how Y responds to this disturbance. Okay, and these, these are a little bit complicated. So when you start plugging in all this stuff, these can get to be somewhat unwieldy expressions over here and taking the inverse Laplace transform can be maybe a little bit more complex, okay? So the, the lecture last time was designed just to show you how to get these transfer functions and now we're starting to describe how to use them, okay? So I showed you this and just showed it to you again. We can derive trans these closed loop transfer functions directly from the block diagram and then these things are very convenient to do lots of things. What I'm gonna talk about today is computing the closed loop response. Okay, um, next time, next time being next Tuesday, I will talk about how to use these closed loop transfer functions to analyze whether the system is stable, okay? Because when you hook a controller back in feedback with a process, if you're not careful, you might make the system unstable by choosing 
the controller inappropriately. So we'll start to develop tools to make sure this is going to work so we can analyze whether the system is stable. Right, this was easy in this case. Right, you just check the denominator, the roots of the denominator polynomial called the poles, and if they all had negative real part, it was stable and you were done. It's a little bit more complicated if you have a controller, so we'll talk about that. What we want to focus on today is the closed loop response. So the idea here is I give you a change in the set point or I give you a change in the disturbance and your job is to calculate what the output looks like. Okay? So it's conceptually the same thing we've done before, but it's just more complicated algebraically typically. Um, and so once you have the closed loop transfer function, you specify this is the step change, you know, like M over S, you multiply the two together, take the inverse Laplace transform. It's that, it's that simple in principle. <laughs> All right. Uh, the problem here is because these expressions that I just showed you for these things are complicated, the chance of having to do partial fraction expansion is greatly enhanced. Okay. Um, so I will show you that via a couple of examples. So here is a motivating example for this. So this is nothing but a liquid level system. So what are we doing here? Well, we'd like to control the level in this tank. Okay. We have two streams coming in. According to the picture, we have no control over this stream, but we can control the flow of this stream. Okay? And then there's gravity-driven flow, according to this picture, out of this tank. So what are we going to do to control the level? We're going to measure it. We're going to send that measurement to a controller, where even though not shown, there's a set point that it's being compared to. The controller will generate a signal to drive the valve. To do that, it has to go through this current uh, pneumatic converter, and then it will It'll drive the valve, open or close accordingly. Okay? So drive the level to the set point. We're going to manipulate this flow rate Q2, and the dis primary disturbance here will be this flow rate Q1. So obviously, if Q1 increases, you have to decrease Q2 to keep the level constant. The problem here is that you don't measure what Q1 is. The only way you know if Q1 changes is you start to see the level changing, right? And then you compensate for it. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here is do a little modeling. This is very simple, obviously. It's just overall mass balance. So what do we have here? Do an overall mass balance in this tank. The accumulation term is, well, take the derivative of the mass of fluid in the tank. That's the volume of fluid. You multiply times the density. That's the mass. Take derivative. That's the accumulation of mass in the tank. It's the difference between the two flows in and the flow out on a mass basis, not a volume basis. That's why I have the density here. Density is assumed to be constant, so it'll cancel across the equation. A is constant, so I can pull it over here and divide through by it. Okay? And then um, I can write this as a deviation model. So see if you can um, stick with me here. So I've canceled the density. right? I take, take A out of here, divide through by A. And now I want a deviation model. Hopefully you agree this model is linear. Okay, because the variables, according to this statement here, are H, Q1, and Q2. Okay, um, Q3 is not a variable here, according to this picture. Okay, so when we find a deviation variable, so this is this, it would be better. Of course, I lied at the beginning. The way the problem is set up, this is not a very good picture. It'd be much better if they had a pump here. So the way you want to think about this problem is Q3 is a constant. You can't keep Q3 constant with a valve because it'd be driven by gravity and that would change. But if I had a pump here, I could make Q3 be anything what I want. So it'd be better if they showed a pump. But okay, so you get the idea. H changes, Q1 changes, Q2 changes, Q3 does not change. So when you go to find the deviation model, Q3 is going to drop out because it doesn't change. So the idea is that I don't want to do it because it's too much work. But if I found the steady state version of this equation and subtracted it from this, I would get these two terms subtracting each other. And since Q3 doesn't change, it will cancel. That's how I ended up with this over here. right? Rows canceled divided by A. Okay. Um, well, I also did something else. Oh. All right. <laughs> Remember when I said, I think you've lost your perspective? I think I've lost my own perspective. All right, let's, let's be, here. Let's do this. La, 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 la. Now we're going to do this slide, OK? You haven't seen this slide before. Let's begin anew. Let's, pretend, let's forget everything you ever thought you knew about this slide. All right. All right, what are we doing? This is our problem. Control level, drive it to the set point. We have this particular disturbance. Um, this particular, excuse me, manipulated input, we have a valve on there, so we can manipulate it. Q1 is a disturbance. Okay, back to this flow, which is haunting me. 
this is correct, because it is a gravity-driven flow, because that's what I have down here. I should have looked. Um, so I have to describe how this flow changes with level. And I'm going to use the following relationship, even though it's not written up there. Okay. So I'm going to assume it's linear. The flow out of the tank varies linearly with the level in the tank according to, and there's some resistance, right? This is the resistance to flow. It's some characteristic of the valve. All right? So I'm sorry about that. All right. So back to my material balance, right? So accumulation term, fl flow in, the other flow in minus the flow out, right? So if these flows are all balanced, the level will remain constant. Otherwise, it won't. OK, now what have I done? Cancel the rows because it's constant. Take the A out, divide by it. Substitute in for Q3 this thing, OK? All right, and then at that point, you have a linear model that looks exactly like this equation, except it has no primes on it. Right, because not a deviation variable. So I could go through the whole procedure of subtracting the steady state and whatever, but I'd rather just put a prime on this, right? So when you do the things I just said, you get exactly this equation, just no prime. So I've just put primes on it and made a deviation model. That's all. Sorry about the confusion. Okay, good. Got that. Okay, so now we have, we like deviation models because we like to take Laplace transform them. The main reason we like to have a deviation when we take a Laplace transform is because when you take a Laplace transform of the derivative, the initial condition is zero. That's why we always like to deal with deviation. All right, so we look at this particular model, and I hope you believe the following. If I were to take the Laplace transform of this equation, and if I were to gather the two terms involving h, one that came from the derivative, the term over here, and then I divided through, I'd get this. Okay, where kp is this thing and tau is that thing. Okay, this is again one of these things where um, you may not see why, if you do this, you get exactly this, but it shouldn't be a mystery to you how I got from here to here. Just you don't maybe see it. Right? But I can't go through every step because the problems just become too unwieldy. So I took Laplace transform as usual. No initial condition here because I'm using deviation variable. Gather the two terms involving h, divided through, and, wrote it, and I wrote it like this. Okay? I wrote it in this form because I like to write systems in the standard first order form if they're first order, right? A gain and then a tau. Okay? I'm calling the, the gain here kp to represent the process. And that's just this ends up being just this resistance of the valve, and the tau here ends up being the resistance times the area. Okay, the cross sectional area of the tank. All right, so if you look at this trans so transfer function, okay, so you'll notice that the disturbance, which is this guy, and the manipulated input u, which is this guy, have the same transfer function. Yeah? Lowercase to uppercase. Which one? Q's, yeah. H's, they, they just, in the book they always do that. I don't think it's necessary. Like you already know it depends on S, but they always capitalize everything. So every time they take, they have a, if they have a lowercase variable and take Laplace transform, they start calling it capital H. It's not necessary, but they do it, so I do it the same thing. Okay? All right. So the disturbance, which is this, and the manipulated input have the same transfer function which is this thing, because you know in our block diagrams, right, we usually have a different transfer function called GD for the disturbance and GP for the process. In this case, they're the same. And it makes physical sense, right, because if you were talking about the level and you talked about what effect does Q1 or Q2 have on the level, they have the same effect. Like, it doesn't matter if you increase this by 10 or this one by 10, it'll affect the level the same way, right? So that's why they have the same transfer function. Okay, with that um, out of the way, I think we understand the problem now, including me. Um, now I'm going to specify other things that I need in the control system, right? So I want to draw the system like this, typical feedback system. So I've already drawn this piece over here. So what, you know, normally what we have is we have the input going through a transfer function, manipulated input. We have a disturbance going through a different transfer function, then they add up to make the output. But because in this case they have the same transfer function, instead of writing it twice, I'm just going to take the sum of these two things and send it through that transfer function. It's just this right here. So it looks a little different, but it's just simplification. Okay. So now I need some transfer function for my measurement device. I'm telling you, I'm just going to call it a gain. This gain is going to take the level, let's say, in meters and, and transform it into something, let's say, in percent. Like 0% means empty, 100% means full. Okay. 
I'm going to compare this measurement to the set point in the same unit. So that means I need some calibration of this measurement device, okay, this level transmitter that takes meters. It's the same thing as this, right? Uh, takes the set point in meters and uh, makes it into percent. Subtract these two signals because they're the same units. Generate an air signal, also in percent. Controller operates on that. I don't know what the controller is at this point. Um, generates a signal. Okay. In this case, they say the signal's in percent. Could be in milliamps. Doesn't make really any difference. Don't worry about the units there too much. This I to P converter will convert this into a signal to drive the valve. I'm assuming the valve is just a gain as well. I'm not worried about any dynamics. And that'll generate the actual flow Q2. Okay. So it just looks just like what we've had before. But I've simplified this because right, GD and GP are the same thing. This, this is just a gain. And this thing is just a gain. So it's a little bit simpler than what you saw before, but same basic concept. Okay. All right. So now for this kind of problem, what we would like to do is we would like to calculate what the um, change is in the level. Let's say what happens to the level if I either change the set point, right, or I change this. This is D for our problem. That's the disturbance. I want to know how that affects the, the level. Hopefully you have some intuition at this point what you'd like to have happen, right? If I change the set point, I'd like the level to follow it because this is the desired value of the level, right? If I change this disturbance, ideally it would have little or no effect on the level because this, I don't want this to have an effect, but it, it probably will, okay? All right, so now what I'm going to proceed to do is to take this example here, okay? And I'm going to consider, see now we've got multiple cases we could do because I could change either this or I could change this, okay? And then this controller could be a P controller, it could be a PI controller, it could be a PID controller. So I'm going to do several cases that differ according to which input I'm changing and what the actual controller is, okay? So this says, for this case, I'm going to change the set point. <coughs> and I'm going to uh, have the controller just be a proportional controller. Hopefully you remember um, if the controller is a proportional controller. Right, that's the proportional controller in the time domain. U equals U bar, the nominal value, plus KC times the air. And then we learned In the Laplace domain, it looks like this, right? I guess I should put a prime there. Okay. So the transfer function for a PI controller is just the gain, just the controller gain KC. We, we went over that like a couple weeks ago, actually. All right. So I'm going to use that over here. All right, so where did I get this uh, unruly equation? I took it out of the lecture I just showed you. In fact, I showed you this exact equation, right? This is the closed loop transfer function we derived for how the output responds to a change in the set point. Now I'm just going to plug in for my particular problem. So for my problem, the output is H. For my problem, the set point is H set point. They're all primes, okay? Um, KM, yep, KM. Case GC is the controller transfer function for a P controller, proportional controller. It's just KC. GV, for my problem, I told you it's just a gain. Okay? It's called KV. The GP is the process transfer function. That's this thing, KP over tau S plus 1. That's, whoops. That's this, this right here. All right? So I'm just plugging in for my particular example. Same thing in the denominator. 1, GC, KC, this thing becomes GV, even though I seem to switch the order around here somewhat. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so the GM is KM. The, the GV is uh, KV, the GC is KC. This is not getting too boring to hear, I'm sure. <laughs> Maybe I should keep doing this. I, I, see, I could put you all to sleep this way. Um, okay, and then the process transfer function, same thing it is up there, KP over tau S plus 1. Okay, so there it is. Now, I can look at this thing in this form here, and I can tell you I can write this as a first order transfer function. Right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to multiply it across by tau s plus 1, you'll, you'll see what I mean in a minute, okay? So you, you, hopefully you understand that. What am I going to want to do? I'm going to specify a set point change, 
okay, like m over s, a step change. And then I want to take the inverse Laplace transform. To take the inverse Laplace transform, you, you want to use the table. To use the table, you have to put it in the form of something that looks like in the table. This doesn't look like anything in the table. So I'm trying to make it look like something in the table. I know I can make this look first order. That's what I'm about to show you. Okay? So when you do these problems, it's very helpful once you get to this stage to know what you can rearrange it to look like. You know? Like when you're doing algebra, it's always nice to know what the goal is. Like you could just do a bunch of algebra, sure, but it's nice to know that you can, what the end game is. So the end game here is to make this first order. So I'm going to call, we already introduced this terminology before. We called all these transfer thing, functions multiplied together G-O-L. Okay? And these are the gains of all those transfer functions, so I'm calling that thing K-O-L. You can just think of that as a definition. Those four things multiply together K-O-L. So I've just rewritten this in terms of K-O-L. It looks like that. Okay? Now, okay, we'll, we'll have a vote. Okay? Who believes that I can rearrange that to look like something that looks like this with these things defined this way? I can get whatever answer I want. Like if I want to do the derivation, I can say, who wants me not to do the derivation? No one will raise their hand. I'll do it. If I ask them who doesn't want me to do the derivation, no one will raise their hand, then I won't have to do it. Okay. So what do I do? It's not conceptually hard, right? I can say it verbally. If you want me to do it, I can do it. It's all algebra, obviously. So I'm going to divide, I'm going to multiply across both sides of this equation by tau s plus 1, right? And then on the bottom, I'm going to have tau s plus 1 plus 1 over kl. I don't want that. I want this, this term down here, s to the 0, to be 1. So then I'm going to have to divide bo both sides of the equation by 1 plus kol. Okay? And once I do that, I'm going to get a form that looks like this. Okay? So. I don't see a lot of, I don't see a groundswell of support for derivation, is what I'm saying. So it's just algebra, right? The key thing is I look at this and I know I can write it as first order to begin with. Okay. I mean, if this thing was, you know, was s squared and this was s squared, I couldn't do this. So you wouldn't be wanting to try, but I can. So I just did what I said. I, I wrote it like this. And if you do the work, you'll see the numerator is this term here and the denominator is that term there. Okay. All right. So. You see, so the idea here is the response of the system to a set point change is first order. Okay? That's what, that's what we've shown. The, the gain is this thing here. Okay? It's not the same as, right, for the process, you remember the process transfer function was kp was this thing. What, this was h prime of s, and the other thing I think was q2 prime of s. We called that GP of S. It looked like this. Okay? That's the transfer function of the process. That's the manipulated input U, that's the output Y. Connect this up into a feedback loop like I showed you. And this is now the closed loop response or closed loop transfer function, right? This is the set point, which is now my input. And this is the output. It also looks first order, but the gain and time constant are not the same as these gains and this time constant, OK? So you see the gain is this thing. And actually, the time constant is the time constant of the open loop system divided by this, which I'll explain in a minute, OK? So when you start doing control, you, you potentially have several k's and several tau's and so on floating around. You have to keep track of which one corresponds to the process and which one corresponds to the controller. Right, because the controller might have a tau i, and then you might have a tau of the closed loop system. You have tau of the open loop system. So, so you've got to keep stuff straight, like what symbol corresponds to what. So this is the gain and time constant of the closed loop system. Okay, and there's their definition. Okay, so once I have this in hand, life is really easy. Because now what I'm going to do is compute the response of this to a set point change. So I just multiply across by the set point, And then I'm going to specify, as usual, the set point is some step change of magnitude m. Multiply the two together. And the reason I put this thing in this form to begin with, because this thing is in the table, right? If you look at something like that, you'll find an entry 1 over tau s plus 1 times s. That's why I did it in the first place. And that's the answer. This should look familiar to you. It's the same as any first order response. The response is k1 times m, which is in the numerator. And then this denominator yields that term there. OK? So if we plotted, well, I'll, I'll plot what this looks like. And never mind. They'll plot it for me, all right? All right, so that's the response. Remember when I used to tell you 
or I've told you several times that we don't like proportional control because proportional control won't guarantee um, that you actually get to the set point. So what I'm about to show you is the response will look something like this. Okay? I'll show you this in a minute, but I just want to explain what the offset is. So here's the output plotted versus time. Here's where we want the thing to go to, right? That's the magnitude of the step change. This, it's starting at zero, and we've changed the set point up to m, and that's where we want the output to go. Okay. But I'm about to show you the output doesn't actually get there. It only gets to this point here. And this difference here is the offset. And so I'm, I'm just I'm going to show you how we calculate this offset here. OK, so there's the solution for the equation. And if you want to know what the offset is, you're, inter you're interested in the asymptotic values, in other words, the set point is this. You want to see where the output quits changing. And if they're not th the same, then that's offset. Okay, So I'm going to take the limit of this difference. Right, This is the difference between where I want the output to go and where it actually does go. There's no offset at 0. Otherwise, there is offset. I'll take the limit of that thing as t goes to infinity. Obviously, the set point goes to m. Okay, If you look at this qu equation and you look at the limit as t goes to infinity, you'll see this goes to k1 times m, Right, just from this equation. And then if you plug in the de definition of k1, which is this right here, you can do a little rearrange it and you can write that this thing looks like this. Okay? That is not equal to, that is not equal to zero. Right? So, so in this plot here, you see I have the output increasing exponentially, right, with a time constant tau 1. We don't really have a time axis here, but it will have a response characteristic tau 1 goes up here to k1 times m, which is not the same as m, because k1 is not 1. Okay. So, whoops. Um, so the problem here is this denominator, right? This de this de if this denominator somehow were really big, this would make this thing smaller, right? If I could make this, if m was 1 and I could make this denominator 10,000, that would be pretty close to 0. So if you look at what defines KOL, you can see KOL is these four things multiplied together. Okay, So let's say I want, you do agree that making KOL big would be good, because it would make this smaller, the offset smaller. So I don't have any control over most of this stuff. I, I can't really control the measurement device's gain, or the valve's gain, or the process gain. But in principle, I could increase the controller gain. right? And in principle, I could keep increasing the controller gain until this KOL thing, which is this multiplied together, got really large. And then this denominator would be really large, and this would get really small, this difference. Okay. All right, so while I could do that, that's not the correct solution because, um, as I'll show you later, when we talk about stability, you can't just arbitrarily increase the value of this thing, typically. Okay. All right, so we've talked about this plot. And so here's an example. Um, for a particular set of parameters that we're going to revisit at the end of the lecture using Simulink. It's, I'm just trying to show you what the effect of KC is here, okay? With this idea of increasing KC should help. All right, so I'm just specifying all the information here, okay? So the process gain KP is this valve resistance, which I've taken to be this number. Time constant of the process, tau is R times A, which I've taken to be this number. This is the pro uh, gain of the measurement device, of the IDP converter, of the valve, okay? So that's basically all the information you need to evaluate all the stuff in this equation. So right to, to actually plot this equation, you need to know what tau 1 is, right? What's tau 1? It's tau, which I just gave you, OK? You need to know what KOL is. I just gave you all four of those gains. So you, well, I'm, I'm going to do it for different KCs. But once I've given you those three, and once specify a KC, you know all those, so you know the KOL. So you can calculate tau. You can calculate the K1. You can actually plot this. Okay, so that's all that's been done here with these parameter values. So here's time, here's the response. So I'm just plotting the solution of this equation that I just gave you for these different values of Kc. Okay, so if Kc is 4, right, the goal here, in this case I'm doing a unit step change, m is 1. So I'm trying to go from 0 to 1, I want the output to get up there. It starts at 0. If Kc is 4, it only gets like halfway there. That's not good. Okay, if I crank it up to 8, it, goes, it gets closer. If I crank it up to 20, it gets closer still. It also gets much faster, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this might lead you to believe that K, you, know, you should just keep going, right? This looks, this trend it looks good. So why not just take it to be 100 or 10,000 or 100 million? Um, and then this could get, get up here asymptotically. So we, again, when we talk about stability, I'll tell you, you can't, this isn't really the solution. Okay? So you do notice that if Kc is small, the um, 
the, it's pretty slow. And as you keep cranking up to KC, not only does it get closer to the set point, but also gets there a lot faster. And you can see that over here, somewhere, um, right here. Right, so just like an open loop system, the characteristic response of the system is controlled by the time constant, tau 1. And tau 1 here is defined to be the open loop time constant divided by 1 plus KOL. So when you make KC large, you're making this denominator large, you're making tau 1 small. And when tau gets small, system responds fast. Okay? So it, in this case, you not only change how, quick, how close you get to the set point, you change a lot how quick it is. Okay? All right, so let's say we didn't like this behavior. Let's see what the next example is. Okay, well, I'm going to do an example in a few minutes where instead of using a proportional, we'll do PI, and you'll see this, this behavior will go away. All right, so there's example one. Okay. This is just meant to illustrate how you go about using the closed loop transfer function to find the response. Now we have two more examples. It's the same concept, just different. Okay. Now. Same problem, except now I'm interested in the disturbance instead of the set point. This is the dis transfer function for disturbances. You can look in the previous lecture. Same denominator, different numerator. Guess what I do now? Plug in everything. Okay. So GD, you remember for this case, is the same as GP. It's this thing right here. Then the denominator is exactly the same as it was on the previous slide. Just plug in all this information for the example I gave you. This is KC. That's KV. That's KM, and this GP is the same as GD. It's that thing. Plug it all in, you get that. Okay. Call these four things multiplied together KOL. You get that. Once you see it look like this, you know you can make it look first order. Okay. Play the same game. Multiply across top and bottom by tau s plus 1. Then divide top and bottom by 1 plus KOL. You'll get this thing here. Okay. Same procedure you used before. It's just algebra. This is one of those kind of things that um, I know you guys are busy and you have lots of classes, but if I'd be satisfied with this, well, I, I can see exactly how this works. But if you can't, you should at least be convinced you could do this if you wanted. Like, you may not want to. That, I accept that, right? But the problem is if you have no idea how I got from here to here, that's probably not good, right? So if you're in that position, you should actually try to do it. But, so I did what I said. I end up getting this, OK? I'm calling this thing now k2, because I don't want you to confuse it with the k1 on the previous slide, which I didn't want you to confuse with kp. You see what I mean? Lots of k's, all right? It's got the same tau, so I'm, I'm calling that again tau1. So tau, so I can write it first order once I do these manipulations. Denominator is the same as it was before. Tau1 is the open loop time constant tau divided by this 1 plus kol. Same thing. <coughs> different gain. So in this case, it's kp divided by 1 plus kol. It's different than the k1, so I'm giving a different name, k2. All right. Again, now once you have this thing, it's, it's easy, right? Because now what I'm going to do is specify a particular change in q1, step change, m over s. Um, and then take the inverse Laplace transform to find the response. Just like baking a cake, all right? All right, so I look at this thing and I'm like, oh, this isn't even remotely exciting, right? One over that thing, it's in the table. It doesn't call it tau one, obviously it calls it tau. And it looks like that, right? It's just like the previous example, except you've, you've got a different numerator, otherwise exactly the same, okay? So there's the response of the level to a change in the disturbance. So in this case, the disturbance is this Q1. It's the other flow rate. Okay. Again, we want to determine if this has any offset. So what we're going to do is we're going to